Hello again, everybody. Welcome to part two. This is part two of our video series here. Um, this time we're going to be talking about changes of state as well as periodic table properties and naming. Remember, please, to complete your fill in the blank note sheet for this one, take any notes that you need to. Um, so here we go, states of matter. So there's three different types of states of matter. The first one that we're going to talk about is a solid, and a solid has a definite shape and a definite volume. So when you look here at this one, this is the molecular drawing. So if I ask you to make a molecular diagram of what a solid looks like, it's going to look like something like this. So you can see in the jar that you have all the different atoms neatly, evenly arranged. They're close to each other here in the jar. And an example of a solid is ice. The next state of matter that we're going to talk about is a liquid, and it has an indefinite shape, so it means it takes the shape of the container, as well as a definite volume. So why it might take the shape of the container, it definitely has a specific volume. So you have 20 milliliters or 50 milliliters, so it takes the shape of the container. Notice here, down here in its molecular diagram, that the particles are still pretty close to each other, but they're not as tightly packed as they once were. Also that they're kind of at the bottom of the container, so it tells you it's a liquid. And our example of liquid here is water, H2O, and we put a little L at the end for liquid. And the last state of matter that you're probably familiar with is gas, and it has no definite shape, so it takes the shape of the container, so it expands to fill the container and takes the shape of the container. And here notice how they're spread apart, they're not compact with each other and it, it's all the way up to the top of the container. And in here, we do have a mixture of liquid, but then do you see the bubbles? This is represented as your gas. One type of matter that you may not be familiar with is plasma. Plasma has no definite shape or volume. Ooh, that was a crazy move. Um, no definite shape or volume, and it has a high temperature where atoms lose their electrons. And so since they're losing their electrons, it kind of changes the properties that the plasma presents. So the sun and other stars are made of plasma. We have plasma in our lights. We have plasma that helps create the aurora borealis, and that's the northern lights. And then lightning, we've got plasma. So while we might not talk about plasma, we see it all the time in the sun, our lights, and lightning. And then if you're up north, you'll see the northern lights. Changes of state video. Ooh, it's going to be a video. Now that we've talked about the various states of matter, we're going to talk about how we specifically classify matter. So matter can be classified as a mixture or a pure substance. We already kind of talked about what a pure substance. We said a pure substance has a fixed composition and cannot be separated by physical means. I don't know if we said that second part, but so that's important. So a pure substance cannot be separated by physical means. On the other hand, a mixture is a blend of two or more kinds of matter each of which retains its own identity and properties, and it can be separated. Let me underline that. It can be separated, and generally by physical means. So a mixture is a blend of two or more kinds. And so when I usually talk about a mixture, a salad's a good example of a mixture. You can pick the different parts out. Um, we're going to be talking about sand and salt and water and how we're going to separate that, so keep that in mind. A pure substance, on the other hand, can't be separated um, in class. Um, so remember, a pure substance would be water, hydrogen peroxide, remember the bad joke I made, um, gold, silver, those types of things. We said mixtures were a blend of two or more things, but they also could be described mixtures as being either homogeneous or heterogeneous. In science class, it's really important you might not know a word, but if you were to break it down into its components, it might give you a clue like on your proficiency exam. So in this word here, we have the word homo, and homo means the same. So we have the composition is the same throughout. So example, air, stainless steel, solutions. So the idea here is air, why we um, can't see discrete individual atoms, it is made of nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen. So it's made of different things that are not chemically combined. On the other hand, hetero means different, so it's not the same throughout. So granite, you can kind of see different types um, of rock in granite. Wood has different layers. Concrete, you can see kind of different layers. And so heterogeneous, it's not the same throughout. So again, I'm going to use the example of a salad here. 
okay? And here I might use uh, chocolate milk. And the idea is probably if you let your milk sit long enough, yeah, the chocolate would come on out of solution. Now one of the questions that you're going to be investigating in the lab is how do we separate a mixture? So remember these are not chemically combined, you can separate them by physical means. The first type of physical mean we're going to talk about is filtration. And so here's a good picture over here. You can see the filter papers in here. You're going to go ahead and pour the liquid in, uh, filter out whatever you want, and then you're going to get something a little more pure hopefully in the bottom. Here's an example of another one. This is like a little vacuum tube on here. It's kind of speeding it up the process. So you're going to pour the liquid through the paper, catches the solid, and lets the liquid pass through. can only be used for heterogeneous mixtures. So if it's a liquid and a solid together, this is a good example. So remember this. If you have a liquid you need to separate, that's mixed um, and solids are mixed in, filtration is an excellent idea. To separate homogeneous mixtures, remember this is the one that are same throughout, you can use distillation, crystallization, and chromatography, and we're going to talk about what those are. The first one here, distillation, is separating by using boiling points. So this is like the distillation apparatus here. So you can see you've got the liquid here in <clears throat> the flask. You're basically heating it up, and the idea is that different liquids heat up or boil at different temperatures, turn into that gas state at different temperatures. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about this year is if I gave you water and I put rubbing alcohol on a table, which one would evaporate first? I'm hoping that you would say alcohol would. So if I had water and alcohol in here, what would happen is the alcohol would come out first, it would come down, it would drain out, then you would get a new flask Okay. And then you could collect the water sample here on the bottom. And the reason you can collect a flask of alcohol and a flask of water is that they boil at different points. And so at one temperature at first, when it's just sort of warm, the alcohol is going to come all out. And then when it gets warmer, um, when it heats up even more, then the water will come out. They won't come out necessarily at the same time. The next process is crystallization. And in crystallization, you boil off or evaporate the liquid. You are left with a solid. So let's say um, you have water, and I'm going to say water, and you have sugar in here. What you could do is you could heat this up. I wish that was red. Heat it up. You could make the H2O evaporate. Okay. And then you'd be left with a layer of sugar, a crystal layer, crystal layer of sugars on the bottom of the beaker. Another type of separating um, separation technique that scientists use is chromatography. So the solution is separated by allowing it to flow along a stationary substance. So down here I'm hoping that in chemistry you did something similar. Maybe you took lettuce, maybe you took leaves. In this example here you can see that the different pigments of a leaf are being separated out. You can kind of see these like distinct lines here. Okay. You can see these different lines it's kind of indicating different pigments that are in there. And um, if you've ever had to take a drug test, this is kind of an example of chromatography. Okay, the next section we're going to quickly talk about is the introduction to the periodic table. Again, you have a few more pages in your textbook that you should read and be familiar with. So when we look at the periodic table over here, it's organized into squares, and so you can see the individual squares. So the first thing you want to know is that groups or families are these vertical columns, so these are groups. Groups have similar chemical and physical properties, important idea to know. And then the horizontal rows, these are called the periods. Periods go horizontally. So you can see that this first one is numbered one. Oops, I just totally covered it up. Two, three, four, five. That indicates the periods. Along with the periodic table being divided into groups and periods, we can also talk about it being divided into metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. So here are some characteristics that you should be familiar with metals. 
Um, they're luster. They have uh, they conduct electricity. They're malleable and they're ductile, and that means they can be drawn into wire. Properties of nonmetals: not no luster. Shock if a metal was had luster. Nonmetals are not luster. Have no luster. They're non-conductors. They're brittle and non-ductile. So they're basically like the opposite of metals. So here's some examples: sulfur, iodine, helium, carbon. Properties of metalloids. Metalloids are kind of weird. Um, they're kind of like metals. They're kind of not like metals. They're called semi-metals because they have some of the properties of metals and non-metals. So here's kind of some examples. These are good pictures here. Check them out. And then group names. Notice they're color-coded here. So this first column are called the alkali metals. The second column are called transition metals, and by the way, you're going to need to memorize this, or at least write it on your periodic table. This yellow section here are the transition metals. Over here, the orange are the halogens, like chlorine, fluorine, bromine. And then the noble gases are the happy guys that do not bond with anybody else, and that's like helium, neon. So there's some different group names there. I would highly recommend writing these on your periodic table because you can use your periodic table on your tests. So the last thing I want to talk about here are noble gases. They're really special. So we call them inert. You might not know what the word inert means. It means non-reactive. Non-reactive. Okay. They're non-reactive gases, so they do not readily re react, hence the word non-reactant. And they're gases at room temperature. So here's your example of helium, neon, that kind of thing. Okay, well that concludes part two of this video. Remember that if you had any questions, please write them down. Um, if you need more information, you can look back in your textbook. And as always, feel free to ask me information or ask me questions in class. Have a good night.